Bright morning stars are rising. Bright morning stars are rising. Bright morning stars are rising. Day is dawning in my soul. Oh, where are dear fathers? Oh, where are our dear fathers? They're down in the valley praying. We've been talking about relearning church, but we're kind of at a turning point now where we're going to not just talk about what relearning what church is and isn't, but relearning what churches do, what a church is supposed to do. You know, there's a lot of confusion about this. You know, churches are not to do political parties. That's not our, that's not our mission. You know, Jesus said that he said that his kingdom is not of this world. That means it doesn't mean that you can't ever have political interests or be care about those things. But but that's not the church. That's not what we do. That's not our primary focus. That's not our focus at all, really. You know, running retail sales is not what we do. You know, Jesus brought that up. He said, my house is to be called a house of prayer, but you've turned it into a robber's den or a den of thieves. So, you know, many, many times this gets confused that churches uh, start to operate like profit centers and selling merchandises. And, and, um, and I'm not talking about having a store in your building. I mean, the actual, the actual community itself is essentially just operating as a sales um, operation. And then church, the church is not to run a country like we've seen in the history of Christianity. Almost all of the most terrible things are when church um, groups, uh, Christodom and other groups, ran countries, whether it was the Church of Germany or the Church of Rome or the Church of, of France or all these state churches. Um, like I said, Jesus made it clear that my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom is this world, I would have them fight, but it's not. And, you know, the church is not running, you know, a sports center. That's not our mission. Or an amusement park like long ago, the failed and disgraced TV evangelist started to decided that the church's job was to start a um, heritage village and built people out of millions of dollars. Church our mission is not to be for entertainment or to operate as a money machine for people to make uh, online or television or satellite marketing for, for $20. I've got a free bottle of anointing oil for you. Hmm. We're not promoters. We're preachers. We're proclaimers. We proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. You know, Jesus didn't say that we were supposed to crush and own our enemies and those that we have differences with. Jesus taught us that in Luke 6, 28, he said, bless those who curse you and pray for those who mistreat you. That part of believing the Bible seems to have slipped aside for many people. He didn't say take over the government so you don't have the temptations to deal with that go with, with society and the world that we live in. Jesus said, pray that you may not enter into temptation in Luke twenty two forty. 40. 
in the midst of great crisis and struggle. He said, pray, not take over. Jesus called us. What do we do? We are to be a house of prayer. Remember he said about the temple, and now we are the new temple. You are to be a house of prayer for all people. He said we should pray at all times and not faint. Somebody said it best like this, praying when it's all said and done. A lot is said, not a lot is done. When it comes to pray, the most important thing you and I can do is just to pray. But, but this is so important. When it comes to prayer, the most important thing is pray. But how do we do it? How do we get into that whole idea? It seems so kind of um, complicated oftentimes when you listen to people or overblown. Well, let me just give you three things that I've said to you before, but they're, I want to repeat them to you in this context because they're easy enough for me to remember. Number one, you need to pray. You need to have a type of closet prayer. This is your closet prayer where you go into your quiet place, your private space, a time of secret, private, personal prayer. You know, the first work is always, Jesus said, you left your first love, repent and go do the first work. The first work was always to ask forgiveness, to pray and ask God for his forgiveness and for his grace and to confess him as your Lord and Savior. That is the first work. That's the first work and that's the next work and that's the work all the way along where we are relying on him and praying. Have you done this? Have you ever done the first work? I know that you may have gone to church or watched these videos, but you know, have you ever really come to him and said, look, be merciful on me, a sinner, like Jesus said. Have you ever prayed like that tax collector, Jesus is standing some distance away, even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but he was beating his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. Have you ever done that? Have you ever confessed him as your Lord? You know, the Bible says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be, not might be or could be, or you hope hope if you actually make it all the way, you will be, you will be saved. This is the first kind of prayer. It's your prayer. Nobody can do it for you. Nobody can be a substitute for you. <laughs> I'm dealing with some mosquitoes out here and you may say, why are you fidgeting around? That's why. First kind of prayer opens the gates to forgiveness and intimacy with God. That's the key. It's between you and the Savior. It begins with a conversation where you can pour out your deepest struggles and have God respond to you. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 6, 5, when you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites. That means the actors. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that you may be seen of men. Truly, I say to you, they have the reward in full. That means God's not going to honor that because you're honoring yourself. But when you, but you, when you pray, go into your inner room or into your closet, close the door and pray to your father who's in secret and your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. You see, what Jesus was condemning here is not not praying in front of other people, but praying a type of performance worship, which is very, very common, especially in evangelical circles. The show prayer, the formula prayer, the see at the pole kind of prayer that is really not about prayer, but really about everybody seeing you at the pole. Prayer is not about performance art or informing other people and making a series of announcements like, Dear God, please let these people know that there'll be a fellowship after the service. Stop preaching. Dear God, for all those people here who are so terrible, or all those people here who need to do such and so. Preaching is you talking to God. And so Jesus is saying, he's assuming your prayer life when you pray, go into your closet. He's assuming that that kind of prayer, that intimate time, that secret time, that closet prayer is happening. But there's a second kind of prayer. There's ceaseless prayer. 
This is you walking with an inward conversation all day long, even in the night watches. The night watches are those moments like you and I have where we wake up in the middle of the night and we're a little bit stressed and somebody's on our mind or we have a bad dream and we pray. We remember to pray. As a matter of fact, Jesus said in Luke 18.1, he was, now he was telling them a parable to show them that at all times they ought to pray and not lose heart. This is ceaseless prayer. You ought to be praying all the time. As a matter of fact, Paul went on to say in 1 Thessalonians 5.17, he said, pray without ceasing. Don't stop. Always have that inward conversation going on with the Lord. You know, in that great passage where Paul is really showing the contrast between earthly warfare and all those weapons that people are preoccupied, he was actually kind of reproving that whole thing by saying, we have something way better. It's the weapons, the spiritual armor and the spiritual weapons, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. And he's saying, let me show you something better than all of this. But he concludes it all with this. None of it has any power whatsoever, unless you get to Ephesians 6, 18, where he says, pray at all with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. Pray at all times in the Spirit. And with this in view, be on alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. So pray for everybody all the time. That's what prayer really looks like. There is, there is closet prayer where it's just you and the Lord. There's ceaseless prayer where you're walking with him. You're praying without ceasing. And this is really what it means to walk by the Spirit. So you do not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You're walking by the Spirit. You're having this conversation with the Spirit interceding even within you. This is what it means to abide in the vine and therefore produce much fruit. And so prove to be my disciples, as John 15 says. This is what abiding means. It means walking in this prayer life inwardly of submission and dependence. And this is what it means to walk by faith, not by sight. You're looking at stuff, and you're, but you're bringing faith to it. Are you praying for me right now? You should be. I need you. You, you say, boy, do you need me. You need me to pray for you. Well, I need God, but I need you to bring me to him. Are you praying for me right now? Because Paul went on to say, even the great Paul, he says, pray at all times in the spirit for all the saints. But then he goes on in verse 19 in Ephesians 6, and pray on my behalf for the utterance may be given to me, the open my mouth and make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains that in proclaiming it, I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Pray for me that I will be able to make it known and make it clear and have boldness. As a matter of fact, you know what you ought to do? That's what I try and do. Practice praying for whatever is in front of you. So if it's me on the screen, pray for me. If it's your kid that's making you stressed, pray for them. If it's somebody in front of you, instead of getting angry at them because they're driving too slow, pray for them. Somebody who's having a hard time, pray for whoever's in front of you. If you're sitting in church, pray for that person in front of you. The Holy Spirit will guide you. These expressions of prayer qualify you for the third way of prayer because it's very important that you that you really put these other ways of prayer into place because if you don't you can easily stumble in this third way of prayer you see you need to practice closet prayer and ceaseless prayer so you can learn humility and avoid showboating that's what closet prayer can teach you you learn sensitivity and discernment to the holy spirit by ceaseless prayer by all through your day and that brings you to the being mature enough to really practice in a healthy way, corporate prayer. This is the idea of when we all pray together, this is important. Hearts join together in one accord. Like Acts 1.14 says, these all with one mind were continually devoting themselves to prayer with one mind, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. It says when you do this, there's a great power that God God honors that and he is blessed by that because it's after his nature of being unified. Acts 4.31, he says, And when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. That's what happens. They prayed in one accord. 
That means they allowed the Holy Spirit to guide them and they were together in a conversation with God. You know, praying with others is incredibly powerful. That's why I always try and give a time for you to be prayed for and to pray with someone at the end of one of our in-person services. Praying with others is not just powerful, but it's powerful because it's a humble expression of what we really are all about and where we stand, where we where we are before God. He's our Father and we're needy. Remember when Jesus said, pray in this way, our Father? It's not my Father or your Father. Our Father, it's corporate. This is how the body can pray. We pray together. That's why Jesus said, again, I say to you, and this is in Matthew 18, 19, again, I say to you that if two, uh, if, that if two of you agree on earth about anything, they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. For where two or three have gathered together, I am in their midst. He says, there is a unique presence of God when we pray together. So you're a priest, remember? You offer spiritual sacrifices through Christ. You as a priest can pray for others and you can pray with others. You can pray together for others. There's a great power. But the most important thing you've got to do is just start praying. Start praying in your closet. Take a little bit of time every day to just get alone, to have that little place with God where you lift up those spiritual sacrifices, those things, those deep hurts and those sorrows and those fears and those, those frustrations that you have, you bring them to the Lord. Somebody one time said it's, so important. It's more important that you talk to men about God before you try and talk. To, it's, it's, it's so important that you talk to God about men before you try and talk to men about God. To get my stuff straight here. This is really important. It's the most important step is to talk to God about men so that you're in the position to talk to men about God, that closet prayer, and that ceaseless prayer as you're going along and you're learning sensitivity and you're allowing the Holy Spirit to guide you and direct you. And then there's that corporate prayer where we gather together. So today, you may have a need. Let's pray. Let's pray together. Let's seek God's grace and his healing today. Let's not Let's not have not because we ask not. Let's not, let's not, uh, and you may be with some other people right now watching this as your family. You could pray together at the end of this. You know, p- the Bible says in James 4, 6, he gives greater grace, therefore he says God is opposed to the proud but gives grace to the humble. Sometimes we do not have because we just didn't ask. We're too proud. Our pride stops us. But God pours out grace when we humble ourselves. And one of the most important things about prayer is it's our way of demonstrating to ourselves and to God that we know we're needy. Humility is God's way for greater grace. And don't you need more grace? I do. Grace to to endure, the grace to love, the grace to deal with life. The undeserved love of God poured through us. Humility is God's way to get more grace. Nothing trains the heart in humility more than your prayer life. So let's do that. You do that today. If you're alone, start with that closet prayer. For those of you who are are even with other people, you can begin ceaseless prayer right now, that inward conversation, talking to God. You can come now in closet prayer. You can come to him alone just as that individual you are, and pray for his forgiveness. Pray for salvation. Come to him and say, Lord, be merciful on me, a sinner. I believe you died on the cross. I believe you rose from the grave. Be my Lord and Savior and forgive me and cleanse me. And and pray, I pray that today. Or you may come to him in closet prayer. Pray for restoration. God, please bring me back to my first love. You know how you get to your first love? By doing the first work. And that's praying before him coming to him, that first work where you confess him as your Lord again. And then pray for other people. And then look for ways to pray together. Maybe you're going to come after you watch this. You say, I'm going to go to one of those services this weekend just so I can pray with some other people. 
And I want you to go forward today praying without ceasing, praying for everything in front of you. Pray for what's in front of you. Well, right now, you can pray for me. But then, as you finish this video, look around and begin to see things you can pray for. You don't have to move. You don't have to say anything. It's a communion between you and God. I hope that you'll do that. And I want to thank you so much. I want to remind you and thank you so much for, for um, all that's going on. Now, remember, this week we have Vacation Bible School starts to, on, on Monday. So pray about that. Pray for all those little kids. Maybe you're going to pray about some kids that you may be able to bring or sign up. You can do that online. You can also give online. Many of you have been giving so generously online and going beyond, above and beyond, trying to help us with some of these projects that we can get done. And um, yes, thank you. And so your ongoing giving has made it possible for us to help so many people. You can look at our website in, uh, at Toledo First Baptist, um, uh, dot com. You can go to that and you can um, see how you can respond. You can say, look, I pray to give my heart to Jesus as Lord and Savior today. Or I want you to pray about me in this area. And then you can mark that in there and fill that in for us. Or you may say, look, I have trusted Jesus. I want to know what to do next. I've heard I should be baptized. Well, we want to help you do that. If you haven't been baptized, you need to do it. And, you know, remember when when you go into the prayer, in, into baptism, you can be like Jesus. You go in praying. I thank you so much for watching this video. But the most important thing you can do now is do what we are to do as God's people, as his church, and pray.